And now please join for our first scripture reading from Exodus 24, 12 to 18. The Lord said to Moses, Come up to me on the mountain and wait there, and I will give you the tablets of stone with the law and the commandment which I have written for their instruction. So Moses set out with his assistant Joshua, and Moses went up into the mountain of God. To the elders he had said, Wait here for us until we come to you again, for Aaron and Hur are with you. Whoever has a dispute may go to them. Then Moses went up on the mountain, and the cloud covered the mountain. The glory of the Lord settled on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it for six days. On the seventh day, he called to Moses out of the cloud. Now the appearance of the glory of the Lord was like a devouring fire on the top of the mountain in the sight of the people of Israel. Moses entered the cloud and went up on the mountain. Moses was on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights. Here ends God's holy word. I'd like to invite the children forward for the children's time. Good morning. How's everybody? There's a story there. You can tell me about that later. How's everybody this morning? Good. Glad to hear it. So not everybody was here last week, but we talked about the Ten Commandments, which are guidelines that God gives us um, about how to live our lives. And if we were to all live into them, then we would be at peace with, with God and with one another. How do you do with rules? Okay. How do you do with rules? Not good? Good? Anybody? Fine? Good, good, good. All right. All the time? No. Pretty much. I think that's pretty honest. I think that's right. I'm good when I understand why, right? Like why, like why should I not touch the stove when it's hot, right? And I think that happens to, you know, no matter how many times we told our kids, don't touch the, don't touch the stove because it's hot. You can burn yourself. Um, have you ever touched the stove? By accident, right? And you learn, oh, that's why that rule is there because it really hurts and, and you burn yourself. You touched it when it wasn't on fire, so then you were good. But if it's hot, watch out, right, because you can burn yourself. So we have these rules in place that we don't always understand. I, um, a few weeks ago, I witnessed a, an argument in my house. That never happens in your houses, right? Nobody ever disagrees. I'm kidding, right? Uh, and I saw it you know, escalate and escalate and escalate, and voices got louder and louder and louder. What was it about? I don't want to tell you what it was about. I don't want to tell you what it was about. In my house, we have this, we say, it's not my story to tell, so I'm, I'm saying it so without telling too many details, but not my story to tell, right? So it was getting louder and louder and, and louder, and then one of these dear people turned to the other one and said, Nobody died. Nobody died in the story. <laughs> it's a good question, though. Yeah. Nobody died. But it, in the middle of this argument, somebody turned to the other one and said, you know I'm saying this because I love you. And, man, I wanted to cry. It was so beautiful. Right? These... God's commandments to us, God's guidelines for us, are because God loves us. And that, make, that's, that makes all the difference, right? It's not to be controlling. It's not to be mean. It's not to, you're going to do what I say. It's because I love you. That makes sense. Does that make sense? <laughs> Thank you, Matthew. <laughs> Occasionally I get it right, right? But it, it makes a huge difference when you know that that it's because of love, I am telling you this. It's because of love, I, you know, I'm, I'm saying do this or don't do this, right? One of uh, people's favorite, if, if anybody knows any Bible verse from the, from the Bible, it's very often John 3, 16, and it starts with, for God so loved the world 
that the only son was given, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not come into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might life have life through him. That's a lot to remember. But it starts with, for God so loved the world. For God so loves us. That's why we're here. That's why we do what we do, because God loves us. And I hope that as you grow, you, you live into that more and more, all the time. Can we fold our hands? Bow our heads, close our eyes, and I'll say a prayer. Gracious God, thank you for loving us. And I pray for these kids, and for kids of all ages here, that they might know how much you love them. Give them eyes that see and ears that hear all the ways that you were trying to love them and bless them each and every day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we will see you later as you go out to Sunday school, and you're going to tell me this story later, okay? Our second scripture lesson comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 17, verses 1 through 9. This is the story of the transfiguration. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and his brother John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly there appeared to them Moses and Elijah, talking with him. Then Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will make three dwellings here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, suddenly a bright cloud overshadowed them. And from the cloud, a a voice said, This is my son, the beloved. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell to the ground and were overcome by fear. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Get up and do not be afraid. And when they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus himself alone. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus ordered them, tell no one about the vision until after the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. This is the word of God for the people of God. And let all God's children say, Amen. And let us pray. Gracious God, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts might be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. There is always a story attached to the, to the phrase, we went up the mountain. If I say, remember the time that we hiked up the mountain? Remember the time that we went up? Story, I imagine that stories are coming up for you of some time when you hiked up a mountain. A couple years ago, while up in Vermont, and I'm pretty sure I have not told you the story, I hiked up the second highest peak in Vermont, Mount Killington, with my, my two kids who were 19 and 21 at the time and one of their friends. And I swear to you, I didn't, I didn't know we were hiking up Mount Killington and... Uh, and I swear that my daughter, I shouldn't, last week we said don't swear about anything, but um, I, I recall her saying this is an easy to intermediate hike. <laughs> it was a easy to challenging hike that ended with a rock scramble, which is not rock climbing, but it's just a bunch of little rocks that you have to scramble over. And my son saw those rocks, and he like, was like a mountain goat and he zoomed up it and I had to call him back and I said you know Ben I said good leadership make sure every make sure that everybody makes it up the mountain I need you to hang out with me just because I'm tired and I might need your hand to to settle me at different places and so with a he stuck with me stuck with me good kid there's always lessons to be learned when you're hiking up a mountain when we left to go up, we figured, you know, we saw the trail an hour and a half up, 45 minutes down. It was three hours up, 
and an hour and a half down. We did not bring enough water or food. I had some very hangry young people with me. And when we got to the top, there were people with flip-flops and food. There was a gondola <laughs> that took people up to the top of the mountain. And my kids, you were just smelling it going, oh, my gosh. And they're like, we could take the gondola down. And I said, the car is down there. We're going to go down the way we came up. And I figured, you know, going up the mountain was the hard part. Going down the mountain was the hard part. I, and by the way, going up the mountain, my, my legs were good. I walk up and down hills all the time because I live in, in hilly Sparta. And I walk every day. And so it wasn't my legs that were killing me. You know, but we had to pause. I, I would say at the time I was thinking every football field length, I would stop and go, okay, we, let me breathe. Let my heart, my, my heart start racing and my, m catch my breath. And then we go again. They were super patient with me. I, brilliant. Uh, but going down the mountain... Within 20 steps, I knew that I was going to be praying my way down that mountain. My knees were in agony. And, uh, and I you know, have since found out that uh, people my age, darn it, getting old, uh, need to walk with poles. I just bought some poles, uh, which I, I've yet to use, but to, to help with the impact. But we're walking down, and the kids had brought music. And on the, which I think is anathema on a hike, right? You sh we should be listening to birds and insects and, and you know, the sound of the, of the dirt underneath our feet. You don't need music. On the way down, they said, Mom, can we play music? I'm like, whatever you want. <laughs> because I also know that when you're exercising or you're, you know, like you're running or you're on the bike or you're doing aerobics, that music can inspire you to keep going. And, and I, there's a spiritual truth in, in that. You might find yourself when you're afraid singing a song or when you're, you, or you find yourself singing and you know that you're joyful. Music, something that we do here. Th and by the way, that first hymn, <laughs> I, 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 I was looking around to see who was smiling. Could, couldn't you just see somebody like doing this through that? Like the whole thing was like a marching band by the, uh, you know, anyway. Music inspires. And uh, and so there's a spiritual truth in that as well. When we got to the base, I asked my son to drive home. I got home, put my legs up, and took some ibuprofen. Posted something on Facebook, and that's when I got all the advice about using, you know, good hiking boots and poles. Was the view worth it? Absolutely. Was I proud of myself? Without question. Would I do it again? Let's pick a different mountain, but yes, absolutely. With my new hiking boots and poles. And with good company. In our story, Jesus, or in the, in the Gospels, we read that Jesus would often you know, go up the mountain by himself. This time he took friends. What was the journey like? What was the conversation as they walked up? Was it challenging? Jesus had just predicted his death and resurrection. Is that what they were questioning themselves about as they walked up? Peter had just said to him, Lord, no, 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 it cannot be so. And Jesus reacted harshly. He said, in other words, he said, you know, Peter, I need you to support me and be with me on this path. I don't need you to tempt me to abandon the path which came out as, get behind me, Satan. But from that we know, and there's a spiritual truth to this, that the, the temptations that we had, Jesus went to be tempted in the desert, those temptations never left him. The temptation was always there to abandon the path. They get to the top of the mountain, and Jesus is transfigured. Again, lots of allusions to to Moses, and we've been, I've been saying this for the last few weeks, that Matthew is trying to paint a picture that Jesus is like Moses, but even better. In Matthew, it, we read, after six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and went up the mountain. In Exodus, Moses awaits 
waits atop Mount Sinai, Mount Sinai six days before God appears. Jesus' shining garments are akin to Moses' radiance when he came down the mountain. The cloud and divine presence are similar to the portrait of God's presence in Exodus 24. But here in Matthew, Moses shows up and Elijah too. And the Messiah has a conversation with the law and the prophets. And then Peter wants to build some tents, some dwelling places. And there's lots, we have lots of understandings about this, but who wouldn't? A place of awe, of clarity, of spiritual, of spiritual vitality, of assurance. Let's make camp. Let's stay here forever. But it doesn't work that way. Then or now. The disciples would carry this moment like a torch back down into some of the most difficult days of their lives, as would Jesus. First Peter, oh, let me, let me come back to that. But I love that. The disciples would carry this moment like a torch back down to some of the most difficult moments of their lives, as would Jesus. The transfiguration is like the, the fulcrum in the, in the Gospels. The way up, his ministry builds, people are following him, and then after this moment, he goes back down into the pa passion narrative, the Via Dolorosa, the journey to the cross. I'm always somewhat confounded by the transfiguration. We have this Sunday every year. And I listened to a conversation between some biblical scholars about the lectionary passages. And they were talking about how we tend to focus that too much, or, and I think this is true more of Protestants, that to focus on the resurrection and we forget the cross. And we think of this time as very linear. And the transfiguration is mystery. I was thinking this morning that, uh, you know, there, there's the folks who say, you know, we are, you know, who say, I, we are an Easter people. And other folks who say, you know, I, well, from biblical, I, this is biblical, I preach Christ and him crucified. And I was thinking of starting a blog, a trans, I am a transfiguration Christian, <laughs> which means willing to embrace the mystery, willing to say that we don't have all the answers, that God shows up in the most mis mysterious ways and we're still trying to figure it out. Jesus comes down the mountain, and, and, it's, you know, and, and we can think of it, you know, as, or people do, as a straight line to the cross and then, and then the empty tomb. Do not pass go. Do not collect $200. But here we have this transfiguration, which is this big question of why. Why did this need to happen? What are we supposed to get from this? And what I understand this week is that we cannot confine God to a path. There is mystery. There is epiphany. There are moments that surprise us. There are God moments when you least expect them. A faith journey will be all over the map. It's, not, it's never a straight line. But thank God we do have these moments up on the mountaintop to carry with us. And I pray that you have had yours. In scripture, we read about the peace that passes all understanding. And I can remember the moment when I was a teenager. I was at a Christian conference, and I remember sitting in worship, and just this peace came over me that just knew that the grace of God was for me and that I was loved and accepted and forgiven and embraced by God's love. Over the years, or when I was younger, I used to pray for more moments like that, that, that just that warmth, that embrace, that light, that assurance, only learning as I have matured that we, I get to carry that moment like a torch into the rest of my days.
and the rest of our days are uphill and downhill and to the right and to the left, and we don't always see the path before, uh, before us, and sometimes it's a rock scramble. But we walk in faith, attentive to the Holy Spirit, and this is our work. The, the, there's God's work and there's our work. Our work is to be attentive. I prayed with the kids that we might have eyes to see and ears that hear all the ways that God is trying to love us and bless us. Our work is to keep our eyes open and our ears open, our hearts open and our minds open as our eyes look for the dawn. And that's that first Peter passage. A gorgeous sentence from scripture. You will do well to be attentive to this as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. I came across a, a, a saying by the Sufi poet Rumi that says, the moon stays bright when it doesn't avoid the night. Go into the dark places, but take your faith with you. Attentive to God's spirit and to your flame. There are moments in our lives that change everything. And sometimes <laughs> we may wish that we, you know, again, want to camp out to have that feeling always, that confidence, that assurance, always and everywhere, but that's not how life, work. it's, life works. It's not how faith works. We have these moments that we cannot explain, that we carry with us in our hearts, that shine like a light in the darkest of places. Sometimes life with all its disappointments and harrowing moments and its sorrows can seem to snuff out the flame. And we can resist resurrection as we resist dying to ourselves. That's another sermon. But the memory remains like a light at the end of a tunnel guiding you home. What I don't like about that metaphor, about that analogy, is that when you think of a tunnel, it's straight, and, and life is not straight. You can't see around the bend. There's day, there's night. But wherever you find yourself on the path, remember that new life can burst in at any moment. You're tired, you're exhausted, you're hangry. You're wondering whether you're headed, where you're headed and will it be worth it. And in God's timing, there's this moment of assurance. I am, I am with you. Take heart. And your face will shine despite the circumstances with joy. Because you have experienced the presence of God. Keep the faith. In Jesus' name. Amen.